Good morning, Accursed. It's Friday the 13th, and we have the bad luck to be discussing the Ontario election, where it seems the objective of every party is to ensure that nothing happens on any given day. I don't even know if yesterday even took place. Um, we seem to be in... <laughs> We seem to be in some sort of pre-debate stasis. I am, as usual, joined by Jenny Byrne. Jenny, how are you? Great, David. Great. Tell us about your hat. It's very striking. So, yeah, very so, so this striking. is a, a Bass Pro Shop teal hat, um, and it was um, sold to support ovarian cancer uh, awareness uh, and charities, and I got it from my friend, Andrea Kent, who's a big listener to the pod. We worked together in Ottawa, and... Uh, she um, she battled uh, ovarian cancer and beat it, and so uh, awesome. she was uh, she was selling these off, and and I bought uh, one for me and one for my sister Jera. Awesome, nice, nice story, Scott. I got a bone to pick with you. All right, <clears throat> I wasted three hours, maybe more, of my life watching the latest Batman movie. Oh, it's dark, literally dark. The, you can't the see the Batman. You can't see much, I know, but it's also dull, and I mean. It was very dull. And doesn't Batman need a superpower of some kind? Like, this is the most pathetic superhero movie I've ever seen. The guy, he's nothing. He's just like a reasonable martial arts fighter in a bulletproof suit. It's, I mean, in an effort to make it gritty, they have, you know, taken it down to like complete street level. Here's the movie for people who haven't seen it. I'll spoil it for you. Here's, here's, here's how it goes. Uh, uh, Penguin has wings too. Uh, a falcon a falcon is a bird with wings a rat <laughs> that's the whole movie that's it i just spoiled it for you that's the breakthrough moment you're like holy that's the oh gosh my jaw dropped to the floor moment it is uh unrelentingly bleak yeah but but david isn't that's but scott okay that's not the only superpower that it's just based on a suit like i i like iron man but it's just based on a suit right yeah, but a good suit that does a lot of things like fly and shoot and stuff. This is just a, a suit. I, I mean, and, and in this. <laughs> <laughs> like if Scott like, put on the Batman suit, it would literally be the same as the dark Batman. Be precisely totally. the same. And I, totally. and, and and I was straight show, through the, the hearts shows of criminals. Up. <laughs> when the guy shows up, he's not fighting super criminals. He's just fighting guys, and he shows up, and they go, oh, fuck, it's the Batman. Jesus Christ. <laughs> but when they're not looking, he vanishes really fast, and he has a he has a car with a rocket ship on the back of it. It makes no sense. It's like, where, uh, uh, you're always going, well, who built that Camaro? Like, didn't, doesn't someone go to Channel 7 News and go, I, Batman is Bruce Wayne. I mean, not only do they look exactly alike, but I made him this Camaro and those little bat shaped things that he whips at people's heads. I made those in my garage in April, you know, and it would be over. But anyway, and it's, and it is literally three fucking hours long. Okay. It's, anyway, it's let's long. move on. You know, you know who's here? Is Allison Smith from Queen's Park Today is here. Uh, hey, guys. Allison? Hey yeah, did you see this latest Batman film? No, I'm not, I'm not a big Batman head, I gotta say. <laughs> I'll tell you, I would have saved you from the first nine days of this election campaign. <laughs> this is the most lively we've been in nine days on the plot. <laughs> Oh, what's going on out there, Alice? Sure. Well, I mean, yeah, I agree with you that yesterday was almost a day that didn't happen. Ford, uh, Doug Ford got asked a lot of those kind of tough questions that we predicted yesterday, but he managed to stay like totally on message and it really didn't hurt him at all. Um, meanwhile, Del Duca lost another candidate and Horvath got asked whether she'll resign after voting day if the NDP doesn't form government. So the we're into that phase. We're into that phase of the campaign. Yeah, I know already, right? So the wind is the wind is I not. I don't want to suggest that it's going poorly. <laughs> but when do you think you'll think about quitting? <laughs> and I don't know what you guys think of her answer. Like she didn't say no. Uh, she said we have three weeks left, and I'm going to focus on that, and I'll fight for everyday people my whole life. I mean, maybe that's what you have to say because you can't predetermine what the membership will want, but it still didn't uh, scream confidence to me. She sounded like a woman looking for parole. I got three weeks left. <laughs> I got three weeks left and I have to look that tribunal in the face and tell them that I'm, uh, I'm reformed and I'll, uh, I'll, get a, I'll get good employment. I'll, I'll, uh, I'm out of here. Well, listen, five times a charm, if that could be her slogan after this election, 
uh, when she loses. Just give me the fifth time. That's all I need, man. Five, five times. They've made at least it, as many it, Batman movies. Maybe she could. <laughs> <laughs> Any time today that, and they're getting worse. They're getting worse. Um, is there any chance that something will happen today? Um, uh, Doug Ford is going to talk to the media again. He'll be out in Windsor, um, which are kind of the NDP turf, but he's looking to, the PCs are looking to grab some seats there. Uh, so we'll see how, uh, how that goes for him. Uh, Stephen Del Duca is going to Scarborough and Barrie and Andrea Horvath is going to a cheese shop in Stratford. So, um, yeah, they're the thrilling stuff, at least on the agenda. Um, but who knows? I mean, maybe another. What is she going to talk about? David at the cheese store. David cheese is always a wedge issue. But a boom! <laughs> <laughs> Good night, folks. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm only here for two <laughs> nights. Tell your friends. <laughs> what is she going to talk about what at the cheese store? What is she going to talk about at the cheese store? I'm overwhelmed. You should see my inbox. Um... Don't worry about it. But it didn't, it didn't. When you saw it, it didn't strike you as something. That meant you had to be at that event. No, it seemed like something she had already talked about before and was just going to be, you know, the same thing with the, the liberals and what you guys were saying uh, after I left the show on policy, that they're really just pushing out other kind of small um, announcements every single day that nobody's really uh, latching on to. But Del Duca promises today to talk about cost of living, right? He does. Yeah, he, so, that's hey, what he said. That's how, how we that? build it. It's, uh, the it surfer Let's caught that what... wave. Uh, you know, <laughs> Who would have saw that coming? He's really ahead of the curve on that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jesus. All right. Well, thank you, Al. Thank you, Allison. And uh, it's the end of another week. So uh, get yourself a bit of a weekend. You're, you know, by the way, I noticed that your your newsletter comes out. It hits my mailbox at exactly 6 a.m. every morning. Exactly. Exactly 6 a.m. So have you timed that, or are you sitting there in the morning just waiting for 6 a.m. to hit the button? Just um, to you and me, David. We can't let you in behind the curtain. This is the, this is show business, baby. <laughs> wow. Wow. Man. Open your pouch. Let us see your magic <laughs> potions. Uh. <laughs> All right, Allison. We'll see you Monday. Thanks. Ciao, guys. Thanks. Mm. Burly Burlyites, I want to expand a little bit on the theme I was talking about earlier this week. The broad topic here is our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and their ESG commitments, environmental, social, and governance. The thing I want to dive in a bit more is TELUS's deep devotion to ESG accountability and how that springs from the way they govern themselves. They have a five-word mantra in their culture. What gets measured gets done. A mantra like that comes with expectations. TELUS measures and reports on all their ESG targets, carbon reduction, community giving, reducing and diverting waste materials, and a long list of other environmental initiatives. But where does that kind of commitment, that kind of focus, come from? Good governance, like any living, breathing, successful thing, is about adaptation and evolution. If a board of directors doesn't reflect and exhibit the skills or the sensitivity for doing business in a sustainable way, it just isn't going to happen. Having the right people matters. The skill sets of TELUS's board members have now been updated. New and now codified is that they must include environmental, social, and governance-related expertise. Also codified, the importance of diversity and equity as part of TELUS's commitment to ensuring that its board reflects the communities they serve. After all, it's the TELUS board that determines where they'll invest the company's time and money and precisely what actions get measured and then reported on. So all the more reason to ensure that it is as broadly representative of Canada as possible. It reflects a couple of other things. The changing nature of their business and their commitment to the issues that matter to their customers, communities, and the planet. You can read more about all of that and more in their sustainability and ESG report at telus.com slash sustainability. Do you think that the, the opposition parties realize the reason no one's covering them is just how irrelevant their campaign stops would be? Listen, I'd love to spend a Friday afternoon in a cheese shop. That sounds like a fantastic idea, but will. I'm also not trying to run to, to unseat a sitting premier. Exactly. I probably will spend some of the afternoon in a cheese shop, but I'm, <laughs> I don't expect to get don't votes. Campaigns. 
Bill campaigns look at a day and say, what is going to happen this day? Like, what do we expect to have? Are we just literally trying to get through the day or are we just trying to put the day behind us? Or what do we expect will change as a result of what we're doing today? Well, you would think that like you usually like you're, you're not in the stage of the let's just get through this fucking day until like a little bit later. Like there's three weeks left. Like you're, you're not usually at that until maybe the last three or four days of the campaign where you just pray the fucker to be over. But like that's a bit early to be um, to be thinking that like they should be in the stage of the campaign where it's a total recalibration. Like it's a they're pulling everyone in on like, you know, it, it, we'll see if they do it. It'd be one of those. We're pulling everyone in on whatever down day. She's got a rally, I think, or something with um, uh, with Jugmeet Singh in Brampton tomorrow. But like you pull everyone in after that and go, OK, guys, this is not working. So we are scr- scrubbing everything and we are building the next three weeks out from scratch. Can I can I um, well, let me let me throw some logs on this fire before you do, Scott. Let me just throw some logs on this fire, because if you if you lift up the hood on uh, Greg Lyle and Innovative's numbers, here's what you see in terms of demographics. Okay, Among men, it's 41 percent Ford, 29 percent liberal, 20 percent NDP. Among women, it's 35 conservative, 26 liberal. 27 NDP. That's astonishing, so, that number. So first of all, if you're if, if the conservatives, as you know, Jenny, are winning women, you're winning the election. Flat out, period. 100%. Right? Okay. 100%. Now, second thing is... And not just winning, like a 9% lead in that category is yeah. huge. Yeah, yeah monster. Totally. Now, here's the age thing. And this is where it gets ugly. 18 to 34. Liberals, 33. NDP, 32. Ford 25, 35 to 54, Ford 40, mm. Liberals 24, NDP 19, 55 plus, Ford 50, mm. Liberals 24, NDP 19. That's, those are, um, that's a brick so wall, this, man. This race is not nearly as close as the top line polling would indicate. Yeah. Well, the eighteen to thirty four, there's less. Uh, like Doug's holding his own. Like there's less of a. Uh, like he's seven points behind the uh, uh, the Liberals. NDP. Uh, yeah. Like that's that's not that that's not bad for it's that. Not even a disaster. Right there. No, no, but that that age bracket is half as likely to vote as the fifty five plus age bracket. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you you take you combine two elements of that. You combine um, the advantage with women. You think about the 905 in particular with what that what that could translate into. And those who are actually going to vote, you know, between your 35 to 54 and your 55 plus. And, you know, that's that is that's a cascade of bad uh, for the opposition parties. And and it also creates some uncertainty for the liberals in the NDP. Like it's hard to it's hard to immediately intuit how the how the vote uh unfolds that that actually suggests a reasonably close race between the uh, NDP and the liberals. The liberals hope hope that it's all concentrated in Toronto so they at least can harvest a greater number of seats. But Jesus H. Christ, it's gruesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I, my, here's what I wanted to say yeah. earlier, David. I wonder, uh, I just, I can't speak for the NDP, even though I'm getting constant. Really? Because that's your job I'm getting on this constant, podcast. I'm getting constant appeals from New Democrats <laughs> uh, to keep talking on their behalf. And to, to uh, <laughs> I'm wrapping you, international brothers um, and sisters. And, um, but, Here's a here's a thesis. I don't subscribe to it. But here's a story. Surely you, they're going to have to change that terminology. I don't think so. Doesn't why it's working. Um, so, you know, if you're the liberals, you watch the federal liberals, and you say, okay, well, we know. And David, we've all talked about this a bunch. David and I are particularly obsessed with this issue about you know micro targeting. Um, so, you know, maybe the provincial liberals, maybe the OLP. Their theory is this. Here's a here's a notion of what you could say. Well, here's what the logic is that we are that we are suggesting doesn't exist because obviously smart people run these campaigns and they don't make stupid decisions. So they have to have an inc- a coherent internal logic. So spend the first 10 days of the campaign before 11, 15, whatever it is, 12, before the, before the big leaders debate. And you try to establish yourself as the alternative to Ford and you give a bunch of policy. So you put in your platform, you give a bunch of policy items, and that allows you to then do 
digital appeals, online appeals, you try to activate micro. So if you care most about hospital beds, you're going to, you care most about mental health, then now I'm going to have a policy I'll target it to you. That's maybe they're adopting that. Then they think they get to the, they get to the debate. They try to have a strong debate performance and they say, now people really tune into the race. And then that gives us time to shift gears. I, I'm just trying to invent a theory that explains what we're watching. Um, but you know, I mean, I obviously think it's flawed because it doesn't hold up against the notion of if you don't create some momentum for change, uh, things won't change. But I, it, that, that's going to that's gonna mean something if they've actually got the lists and the means to be able to do micro-targeting and, yeah. and reach out to people. And so if they've done nothing in the last kind of four years to uh, to do that, uh, then it's then it's for naught. Like the liberals with Pitfield and the, as soon as, you know, during Trudeau's leadership race, after Trudeau's leadership race, there was a huge focus on data mining and collection and and yep. you know identifying issues and so there seems to have been nothing in in terms of that sort with um del duca and and let's not forget i don't know the, I, don't, I don't know do we and, know i don't know and, if there is or not i know they and, don't have much and, resources but and and also that wasn't all they were doing Tr trudeau also did have an army of people like we saw an army of people he had he had good he had volunteers and stuff out in both the 19 and the 21 elections too um when people were becoming generally disaffected with him and so what i'm hearing from people on the ground um um, is that there's almost no sign of the liberals in terms of a volunteer uh, infrastructure. Because when you're on the ground, you see what the other campaigns are doing, whether you see them out personally, you see what's happening around the community, you talk to people. Um, and I've heard from my friends uh, in the different local campaigns that um, they're, seeing, they're seeing the dippers out for the most part, but they're not seeing the liberals. So either the liberals are really uh, honing in on ridings where it's not, it, it, it's, there's no chance for us and it, they're fighting the dippers or the dippers actually have a strong, uh, a much stronger on the ground presence, which when it comes down to E-Day, David, as you know, uh, when you're screeching it, when you're like trying to bring out between that two and 5%, uh, it means some of the close ridings where the NDP and the liberals are fighting, the advantage could go to the dippers because they have more resources and infrastructure. Well, Jenny, over, over the years that the liberals were in power, the volunteer base uh, atrophied incredibly and was largely replaced by Queen's Park staff. Yeah. So the people that would run liberal it's campaigns were Queen's Park staffers. And that was the political machine behind the Liberal Party. It was an exceptionally well-trained group of people um, and they were a good political organization, but they were staffers. And when they lost their jobs, they were gone and there's nothing to replace them. And you don't rebuild that in one, one term. Yeah, it's one of the dangers of being in government, right, is government takes over party and, you know, it, unless you cultivate the party very aggressively, then it just atrophies, like you say. Ontario is facing an historic housing affordability crisis, probably the worst in our province's history. Right now, if you get in your car and drive down a 400 series highway, you'll find 10 local markets where the average price of a home exceeds a million dollars. Even in small towns like Kawartha Lakes and Fenelon Falls, the birthplace of the curse's own Jenny Byrne, an average priced home is over $800,000. So when 46% of Ontario home buyers say that they are looking to move outside the province to find a new home, you can see why. Our original sponsor, the Ontario Real Estate Association, says years of bad policy, a lack of supply, increased demand and rising costs are to blame. If we don't do something about it now, home ownership may be out of reach for an entire generation of Canadians. That's why this June election, realtors are calling on all parties to reduce costs for first-time buyers, get more supply into the market, and end exclusionary zoning rules that keep middle-class families out of growing neighbourhoods. You'll be hearing a lot more from Maria over the next several weeks about Ontario's housing affordability crisis and what can be done to fix it. Because Aurea wants to see more young people become homeowners, and that starts with building a home for everyone. Read Aurea's plan at ahomeforeveryone.info. So, uh, Queen's Park today actually had something interesting today, this morning. Don't really say it like attention. that. Don't say it like that. Every morning they're interesting, but this morning really caught my eye <clears throat> on ad spending. Yeah. And I'm just going to read you a little glimpse, a little bit of this. After issuing digital advertising for the first week of the campaign, the PC party is now betting big on Facebook and Instagram ads. The party rolled out seven different paid ads on Wednesday and Thursday, 
per Facebook's advertising library, four of which attack Andrea Horvath and the NDP as an expensive disaster who protest, criticize, and delay getting anything done. Another two ads feature ex-Grit Premier Kathleen Wynne and warn that Stephen Del Duca wants you to forget the years of liberal scandals and corruption. The NDP, meanwhile, has eight Facebook ads on the go, three of which focus on hallway medicine in Brampton, and another that promotes the NDP's plan for OHIP dental coverage. Um, Doug Ford has got to go, state two other ads from the NDP. The Liberals have spent the most with Facebook, 200000 in the last week, running dozens of ads that promote a wide swath of their campaign promises, including clearing the surgical backlog, fixing schools, scrapping online learning, building 1.5 million homes, improving home care, canceling student loan interest, and much more. So there you go. That validates my argument. That's what I think they're up to. They're, they're saying, okay, we have a platform that gives us 100 arrows. We'll shoot them all. They'll be invisible to the public at large, but hopefully they land with the intended target. I just don't know if it's... Is it is it on a substantial enough scale that it's actually going to create momentum and difference? Um, you need something to follow up on that. It's not you're not yeah. just getting straight IDs from Facebook likes. Only six of the OLP's sixty four active ads attack Ford. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we're a broken record on this, right? I mean, this podcast shouldn't be called the Curse of Politics. This podcast should be called Get on Ford's Ass, right? And it's you know, I was going to say the Curse day. of Del Duca. <laughs> well, I mean, <clears throat> I just don't get it. I just don't. I just don't get it. 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 Um, uh, I just don't think that's the way voters are going to are going to make up their minds uh, in this thing. Um, and anyway, so um, Ford. <laughs> let's talk about Ford for a second. Uh, I want to. I want to move into the binder issue and talk about debate prep a little bit. Debates. But there was a line yesterday from him that, to me, perfectly encapsulates um, how he skates through this job in a way that I've never seen anybody skate through this job before. And it's about the Lisa McLeod and all the other people topping up their incomes from their riding association accounts. And he says, I'll be pretty frank. I wasn't too happy when I found out about this. I want to emphasize this. I've been assured that all rules were followed and the expenses are independently audited. They're reviewed and approved by Elections Ontario. That being said, I want to take a good hard look at these rules and tighten them up. (laughs) And that seems to end it. (laughs) Well, it ended it because there's there's no story to this. Riding associations, uh, uh, you know, raise money. They spend it as long as it's within the rules. It's... Uh, to what Doug said, that the expenses are audited and uh, approved by Elections Ontario. If there's problems, Elections Ontario comes back to you uh, with them. So the reason it's not a story is because it's a real giant nothing burger. Yeah, I don't agree with that. I, 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 no, I'm necessary. just referring. I was, I was referring, use, Jenny. But parties use money. I, I the, agree with that. But sometimes part- an issue that's not well known to the public can still overwhelm you and bite you in the ass. I, I, I'm i in the same position as you. I'm sort of like, well, you know, writing associations will care, uh, occasionally subsidize this and that. And we kind of go, well, we've been involved in politics for 30, 40 years. We all know that that happens. And then, but if it's a revealed truth to the public and they go, well, my God, that's your money, you know, because it's supported through the tax system. All of a sudden, like it could mushroom into an issue, but it hasn't mushroomed into an issue. Because uh, And in part, because for... Well, maybe, but they're not doing much to make it an issue. And then, you know, and then Ford just kind of goes, my God, you know, like even I'm pissed off about this. But if I can find the guy who's in charge of this party, I'm going to fucking give him a little tongue lashing. And off they go. Jenny, uh, Jenny, have you ever seen anybody who had the capacity to talk about his own government as if he was an observer of it? No, that, listen, this is the, that is, this it's, is the brilliance of Doug. Uh, like nah. this is, this is when he is at his. This is when he is at his best, right? Like he's, he's, you know, um, uh, he's on the the stump. He's at his best. And frankly, the opposition don't call him on it for the most part and the media don't cover him. So he's got, he's lucky. He's lucky there. So like people can complain about it, but that's what people like. (laughs) Um, uh, This is when Doug is at his, um, uh, this is when he's at his, his, his best, whether you like it or not, it's, it's the, it's, it's what people are drawn to. It's what, why he's leading on almost every metric in the polls that we're, um, uh, that we are, um, uh, that we are seeing, but at the end of the day, it's, it's up to the opposition and media to, to hold, uh, all political parties to account and, and 
you know, I just think though, that with this one, there's just no story. People, people do not, cause they're reading it and they're like, we don't get this. We don't understand it. We really don't care. It's the dumbass. So dividend. Scott, it's the dumbass. Dividend, dividend, right. Why would you have never considered writing a line like that for any of the leaders that you have served? Because nobody would have bought that out of the mouths of the leaders I've worked for. And I would write it for Doug Ford. Um, I wouldn't even write it. I would just say, okay, go out there and scat that way you scat about like not being in charge, but awful pissed off about the way things are running around here. You know, go do that thing, Dougie. Um, Because, you know, like Jenny says, like this stuff doesn't stick. And in part, it doesn't stick. And I, and I even have a twinge of sympathy for the opposition parties, like the amount of energy and the strategic decision to to really deploy on this. You got to think to yourself, well, the underlying issue had better really be a volcano, because you know to overcome the media's discount that they provide for it inherently, in, in instinctively they do it, whether they're even conscious of it. The dumbass dividend I talk about. Well, you know, fuck, he's down. Yeah. And, but it's also people. Go talk to people in a coffee shop or a bar, right? And they kind of go, ah, you know, fucking Doug. I mean, like, let's be honest, right? He's got a finance minister or somebody who knows about all this stuff. He doesn't know about that stuff. He's kind of, he's just a guy who's out there kind of going, hey, hey, good to see you and clapping you on the back. So it takes, it, it, it in order to elevate it to a point where people say, all right, well, I am going to be persuaded to evaluate the government and his uh, prospects of re-election on this issue, it has to really mushroom into something massive. And you have to put a huge push behind it because he gets to sort of water off a duck's back most of these things. It's the dumbass dividend. I don't expect anything better of the guy. So don't be shocked when that's what I get out of the guy. And people should show it. Kathleen Wynn professed ignorance and uh, and and in and sort of you know lack of insight to the issue. She'd get crucified. World isn't fair, man. Just world ain't fair. Yeah, no, it is not fair, is it? <sighs> Jenny, is the world fair? No. Look at the way no. it's treated Sorry. us. Look at how the world is. <laughs> Kicking the shit out of the three of us day after day. Not fair. <clears throat> so this debate, the latest issue, the latest issue that's got Twitter all a flutter is that Doug Ford is bringing a binder into the debate. Is this unusual? No. No, I don't think so. Uh, when we've when our guys debated each other, they ha they had binders on stage. I, I, I like. I actually don't even. Paul always had a. Paul always had a binder, didn't he? My God, man! I was the poor son of a bitch that had to stay up all day for six days in a row <laughs> writing it. Me and Festchuk <laughs> with a bottle of scotch and poor Robert Aslan translating shit into French after we were done. Blah 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 blah. Yeah, no, value is... statement, <laughs> proof point, big close. Value statement, <laughs> proof point, big close. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking kill me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, are, what, what, why are people trying to make a story of it here? Was it, did they not have them last time? I don't, maybe they didn't have them last time. I can't time. remember, but I don't think it's a big deal. And the reason no one's going to pay, pay, like, this is, this is a, nobody cares. Like, who cares that leaders get to take binders up with them? Like, I, I was actually, I'd be more surprised if they, if they weren't allowed to take binders or they didn't, they, they didn't take binders up with them. It's a weird flip-flop of what we were just talking about. A moment ago, we we're talking about how hard it is to try to turn these issues about Ford and his indifference and lack of facility with detail into an issue. And yet that's what's underlying this, right? Doug Ford needs a binder. He needs a crutch. He needs a script to get off that run. Well, he used the crutch the other day to get off that run in the Northern debate. And whether he had a piece of paper in front of him or not, he crushed Del Duca on it. So... You know, but I've got, I got a binder. I don't know if you guys know this, but I bring a binder every day, right? Just is like it full Ford. of women. It's full of, it's all, I'll tell you what it, it no, it's, it's, it, I bring this binder in just like Doug. It's full of Molly Hatchet lyrics and uh, a little, there's a page, it's DF heart hash oil. And um, it's, you know, little, a picture of Pamela, uh, you know, Melissa, Pamela Sue Martin. Like it's, it's got all the 1978 uh, highlights, but what are you going to, what are you going to do? Like, I mean, I just, it's the lamest thing, you know, we're not talking about cost of living, but we are talking about whether or not the guy has a binder and, you know, how many pages he's allowed to have. And it's just, fuck man, somebody get this goddamn campaign by the throat and shake it. Please before Monday, um, there is something that happened. That's really of quite note on the campaign the other day. And, and one of our readers and uh, one of our listeners, we've readers, we've Christ, readers, I'm old. Yeah. readers, we issue one a transcript every day for the earnest. <laughs> 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 
and studious. <laughs> One of our listeners pointed it out that we had not talked about what happened to Singh in Peterborough when he was campaigning in this provincial election. And, uh, you know, all kidding aside, that's ugly shit. And that can't get normalized. Like, what can people in politics do to make sure that people understand? Like, what can everybody in politics do to communicate generally, to calm down about this shit? And that that isn't cool to be fucking out there attacking people like that and saying that kind of shit to them. But this isn't new. Like, like... This seemed pretty extreme to me. Okay, well, I think it's not... Listen, I I don't justify it. I don't justify cursing and swearing at politicians or anyone to be to be honest um but it, it was he was being yelled at like this is not we make it seem like this is the escalation to something that didn't happen we've watched leaders Mila Mulroney was attacked in 1988 at a debate I was a reformer in uh, uh in Ontario and and at every location Preston Manning was uh was uh was absolutely swarmed by people I remember doing an event at much of the much music media st- st- station and being in my early 20s and having to be escorted in uh by the police because there were so many protesters and people were spitting at us and all of that kind of stuff like it's I, I, I like I, I'm not justifying it, but this whole notion that we've never seen anything like this before um, is stunning. Stephen Harper, there, there, there wouldn't be a, a year that gone by, got, went by on the environment where, um, you know, a paper mache um, effigy was burned um, and stomped upon uh, by by people. So I'm not I guess I don't understand why we think this is. Uh, this is a new concept. What we're t- the difference? Maybe it's the maybe it's the tur- I'll be honest. Maybe it's the turban that made it land differently with me. Of course, and just made it feel differently with me. But I think that the focus of it was his was his uh, was the NDP coalition with the with the Liberals. That's that's what the the people were yelling. Like you should be ashamed of yourself. You're propping up this corrupt liberal uh, government. So I, I'm not like as I said, I'm not justifying it. But this whole notion that this stuff does not happen. Um, it, 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 it just isn't, it isn't true. Like look at Trudeau, the Trudeau, the elder, like you can go back to many incidents in, where he was, let, look at the, in 1968, the St. Jean Baptiste uh, parade. And I just think that it's a, and, and parties have done it too. Look at the liberal party of Canada had to apologize under Trudeau when they put the picture of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald uh, getting shot and transposed Stephen Harper's face on it. So I have, I, I do not agree with people cursing and swearing and yelling at politicians, but I think it's absolutely like, completely naive and misleading to say that this stuff has not happened over the years um, uh, to other politicians. I don't think that's what people are claiming, though. I, and it's not what I claim. It's not that you, you can't find incidents in the past. I think that there's um, – I, th- I think we're on a continuum. I think we're on a continuum where populist grievance politics is turning into populist anger politics. We're harnessing anger and we're normalizing uh, conduct. And yes, everybody went out and condemned this yesterday, but we're on a continuum here. And we've been told for 10 years, you know what, let's start breaking down norms. Let's start actually ignoring this. When these things happened in the past, they were seen as extraordinary events uh, that seemed like they're completely at jarring and at odds with everything else about our political process. Now you kind of go, well, God, it almost feels like it's, you know, it's only one step away uh, from what we witness. And so, you know, if, you know, we're going to truck in traffic in, uh, in in anger and tell people their anger is justified and tell people that they're right to be pissed off and they ought to uh, distrust their institutions, hate their politicians and uh, and spiel invective, then don't be surprised when you get this kind of shit. And yeah, sure, it's got a racist element uh, under it. That's even all the more ugly. People used to have the good sense to be ashamed of that shit. Now people don't even uh, don't but even feel embarrassed. But how do we know it has a racist element to it? I've, I've, I've read nothing about that. Okay, let's let's flatter these guys by dissecting uh, the precise words they said. No, I'm not. They're but I'm screaming not, I, at a guy with brown skin and a turban, calling him a fucking piece of shit. Well, were, I think that's. Were, a, were, I think there's were, a racialized dimension to that. What they were what they were saying was your 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 what they were upset about was the coalition with the liberal with the with the. Uh, uh, with with Trudeau, they were upset about the coalition with Justin Trudeau. So I, I'm just saying, I like if that was obviously uh, if that is an that was an element uh, that is obviously 100 percent wrong. I just I've never seen there was no nothing in it said in the media that that was the case. What they were saying were people were going, fuck you, you're propping up Justin Trudeau. Fuck you. You have a coalition with Justin Trudeau and he's ruining this country. I'm saying, fuck you. You're a piece of shit to a man with brown skin and a turban communicates a pretty strong message with respect to racialization from my perspective. And I just don't think that I'm alone in that impression. Well, I'm a, I'm an odd person to be calling for civility, but I just, I just really think that people need to fucking get their shit together about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate in terms of how you make your case. 
Well, the reason um, the reason that people don't take then um, uh, everyone serious in their commentary on this is because uh, it seems that there's a lot of people within the media and within the chattering class that 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 have had no problems with conservative politicians being protested okay. and death threats and what have you. But uh, but over the last six to eight months have had a real problem with um, protests uh, of, of issues that they find uncomfortable and don't like. So so th- 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 there, there is a real hypocrisy between the two. If, right. if burning a prime minister in effigy over an environment policy is OK, um, then uh, and, and you think it's fine, then you're, you're being an absolute. Who said that stuff is OK? The question is whether that stuff has migrated into the almost accepted toolkit of political parties and political leaders. That's the problem, is when you say to people, actually, you're right for breaking the law. Actually, you're right for yelling and screaming and cursing in people's face. That's fine. You're justified in doing that. That's okay. Then you break those norms. You invite people to break those norms. Don't be surprised when they then take it one day. But Scott, it's not a question of, so let's leave aside whether people are saying do it and it's okay to do it. What, What could people, what kind of signal can anybody send not to do it, that it's not okay? Like what? How do you put these genies back in the bottle? Well, you can say I'm not gonna. I, I, I'm not gonna try to validate uh, your bullshit, uh, incorrect assertions, and I'm not gonna validate your 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 conduct. So it's incorrect that Justin Trudeau and Jagmeet Singh have a have a coalition deal, and and, and the NDP are propping up uh, a government, and they're lighting them away with zero, almost zero scrutiny on any issue. Well, that's not true, and people are entirely uh, welcome to uh, argue. Then, and that wouldn't. And that wouldn't. That would that that still wouldn't justify getting in his face and calling him a traitor. I'm not spitting. I'm not yeah. saying that, but I'm saying I know you're not. I know, I know I'm you're not, not saying that, but I'm saying David, there is there is a real hypocrisy and there is a real double standard from what um, I've seen uh, over the years in terms of the protests and what have you that have been covered as as what is happening over the last six months. Uh, uh, I think that's, a, you know, that's a refuge argument for those that want to traffic in anger. That's not true. Politics. That is absolutely not true. And this is this is why this this is why the mindset of liberals and why the NDP and the liberals uh, provincially are doing are, are where they're at now. Like if there's if there is zero ability to I've said this to you guys before, you get so tunnel vision sometimes if you have no ability to see where the other side is coming from, you have no ability to actually be able to formulate an argument, a coherent real argument against against them that is not just rooted in, gu- in guttural emotion. And that is the problem that I find the liberals, the left, the media, guys like, like you have, is that you can't rationally look at the other side of the arguments. Yeah, and I disagree. And I'm I sorry, Scott. Disagree. I'm sorry, Scott. You, you're out of paddles. Mm. Oh, shit. That's right. You're uh, out of paddles. Well, you well, can't respond. Hopefully, hopefully <laughs> Leslie and Lewis will take up my argument. <laughs> <laughs> Time flew today. Nothing to talk about. We found some shit. All right. Blessing or curse? Who wants to go? I'm going to do one of both, and it's going to be on the same theme that I think I've done every day. This election is an absolute fucking curse. Of, uh, uh, it, it is it, it, like it's it's it, it's it, like it's just it's it's a painful thing to watch. Which means again, it is a blessing for Doug Ford and the PC government and all my friends running campaigns and running in this election. We should run old. We should run like episodes from a week ago and see if people notice. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding, man. Eh? Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I, give us, I thought I heard what? Reed make that Chris Christopherson <laughs> joke before. That sounds familiar. Give us, give us something to do a blessing or a curse of out there, everyone. All right. Mine is more or less the same, and we are both directors. Mine's a blessing. My blessing, I'll just, you know what? I will, I will, I will dam, I'll damn with faint praise. Uh, thank God the, the liberal campaign says they're going to be doing something on cost of living today. I will say, great. I've been calling for it, so I will bless it. And here's my hope. I want you to do it today. Do it tomorrow. Do it Sunday. Do it Monday. And do it most of all in the debate. And by the way, haul that 64, that set of 64 Facebook ads, right? And get rid of the ones that are introducing Stephen Del Duca and, you know, talking about, uh, you know, micro policy issue A to Z and make them about cost of living and make them about Doug Ford and lay it on the guy and try to nail something to his forehead. Otherwise, um, this campaign is over and it's literally, I think we can say that this campaign is over here on the 13th, the Friday the 13th of May. You don't think this campaign turns on canceling student loan interest? You don't think that's an important advertisement (laughs) to have out there? Well, I mean, I guess if you got a good enough Facebook ad on it, um, (laughs) I don't know. It's always like you and I are howling at conventional political practice, right, David? I mean, you know. No, I don't think so. 
Uh, my blessing goes out to the NDP War Room, which uh, I think had a earned their uh, earned their keep this week with the uh, with the uh, yeah. uh, Conservative MP slush funds with some Liberal candidates in trouble. The NDP War Room did their job this week, and I think not to put too much pressure on both the War Rooms, but I'm increasingly convinced that Ford only gets derailed by a revelation now. Uh, I don't see a normal campaign event intervening to change the direction of this. Um, so it's down to either the debate or a revelation about Ford. So war rooms, I can double down. It's a good All one. right, folks, good we will uh, we will see you on Monday. We're taking the weekend off. Uh, so presumably are the we'll campaigns, notice. and uh, we'll be back. We'll be back on Monday to set up the debate. Boy, that will be exciting. You won't want to miss that one. We'll see you Monday morning with the Curse of Politics. I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS. I'd like to thank the Ontario Real Estate Association, our original sponsor. I'd like to thank Allison Smith and Queen's Park Today, Greg Lyle and the Innovative Research Group, Scott Reed, and of course, Jenny Byrne.